Okay, now we're recording. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Maria Stanger, for joining us today, who um, I will continue introducing in just a moment. But this is part of uh, ISU OER Week, and <clears throat> this is the last presentation of an entire week of presentations about open education resources, which include affordable resources. And um, according to the State Board of Education, that includes links to library resources. So uh, they may not be free in the traditional sense of OER, they may be affordable. So, so that includes OAER. And uh, we invite you to attend the rest of our rec um, previous recordings through our website. <coughs> will be up as of next week that will be out on library news and i will put that in our chat one moment here is our isu channel and then for those of you who are a little bit unfamiliar with what open education resources are here is the library's webpage about oer resources and projects that have been done in the past, and also the ITRC's webpage and how they can help with that process. We have a lot of support here at ISU and are really excited about open education resources. Okay, thank you, Dr. Marie Singer, for joining us. She is a professor in history and teaches um, US history and women's history. <clears throat> She researches and teaches in the fields of U.S. history and women's history, excuse me for repeating myself, and her interests lie in slavery and emancipation in the Atlantic world, women, gender, and sexuality, African and American diaspora studies, 18th and century U.S. history, unfreedom in American history, and the American empire. Did I get that correct? Yes, absolutely. Great. So her previous uh, OER uh, experience she shared before with us um, in a general education course for history 1111, I call it, or 1111, U.S. history. And this previous stipend uh, has been for history 2201, uh, Women in U.S. History. And with that, I hand it over. Great. Oh. One last caveat. Uh, as we move through your presentation, feel free to put questions in the chat, but we will reserve answering them until the end. So as you think of them, go ahead and put them in, but we will answer them at the end. Thank you. Perfect. Thanks so much, Laura, and thank you all for spending your Friday afternoon with me. Um, I'm really delighted to talk to you about some of the ways that I've incorporated OER, um, as well as affordable resources into my courses. Um, I'm going to start by talking a little bit more broadly about what it is that I do in my history courses and what needs that I have uh, in terms of um, materials that I have students read. Um, and I think that will help contextualize some of the ways that I think about using open and affordable resources in my classes. Um, and I apologize if any of this is stuff that you already know really well. I think it's, it's good to just start with, um, start all on the same page. So I teach in the history department and history texts more broadly speaking can very loosely be placed into two categories primary sources, which are sources that come from the time period that we are studying. So say, for instance, I'm teaching a lesson on the American Revolution. Primary sources on the American Revolution would include things like the Declaration of Independence, right? Things from the late 18th century. The other, again, broad category of sources that we use in history are called secondary sources. And these are historians' interpretations and narratives about events. So me writing a book about the American Revolution is a secondary source because, of course, I didn't live through it. I'm not a firsthand account. Um, so this is an important 
piece of information to keep in mind because when I teach history courses, I like to assign both primary and secondary sources. And this was something that I encountered in exploring some of the OER materials that some resources were more secondary, some were more primary, and how do I balance the two? Um, in history courses, generally speaking, I assign a few different kind of iterations of these sources. Sometimes I've assigned textbooks, which are typically narrative driven, distilled information taken from a bunch of secondary sources, and the editors synthesize all of those sources into a textbook. So if you took a high school history class in US history in the United States, you're probably familiar with this format. I occasionally use those kinds of books in my courses, um, but more often than not, I assign scholars monographs, so secondary sources, um, that are more academic and more based in ori original research. And then the other thing that I truly emphasize in my courses are primary sources. Um, primary sources, again, come from the time period in question. These are kind of the bread and butter of what historians use. And this might be um, a text such as a newspaper article from the 18th century, or it might be a text, I'm using text in the kind of broad literary sense, um, a film, right, for instance, can also be used as a, as a primary source. Um, so I like primary sources in teaching history because they give students a hands-on approach to doing the work of historians. It's not simply about memorizing facts, dates, information, but rather getting the opportunity to engage with these resources, to um, try to make meaning out of them and try to understand the past through them. Um, so when I'm picking out materials for a course, I'm typically looking for a mix of secondary and primary. Um, that might mean that I assign a few different books in a course instead of just one sort of um, narrative driven textbook. Um, for general education courses, which are the two courses that I have worked on um, finding open and affordable resources for, I generally like to use the same kind of mix, um, primary and secondary. I'm going to talk a little bit about what I did in History 1111, the survey of US History 1 um, that I got a grant to explore OER materials for in 2019-2020, because my experience is doing that directly shaped what I did for History 2201, which I did with this past grant. Um, so U.S. History 1, History 1111 is a GEM Objective 6 course, so it's a, it's a general education course um, throughout the state of Idaho that emphasizes social and behavioral ways of knowing. It's essentially a course in which we talk a lot about methodology and the kind of work that scholars do in the social sciences, what that methodology looks like, what the practice of working in that field looks like. Um, and so in in 2019, 2020, I was able to explore OER resources and indeed adopted an OER textbook. So that course, History 1111, is the one in which students do not have to pay anything to access the required material for the course. Um, the textbook that I use for that class is hosted online. It's called American Yop. It's a collaborative book, which is also really fascinating too. I actually contributed to some of the chapters when I was a graduate student. It's also a constantly evolving text as well because it is hosted online and the editors um, work to update it quite regularly based on new scholarship and new information and new things that they're emphasizing in this text. So that OER resource, that OER American History textbook works really well for History 1111. Um, and then the other thing I do in that class is I, again, because it's a Gen Ed Objective 6, it's a methodology course, it's a course where they're really learning a discipline, um, I have students find and analyze primary sources as like the key assignment piece of that course. Um, so I make a lot of use of OER resources as well as subscription databases from the library for, for that course. I have students go in and look for um, these sources sources themselves. And so everything in History 1111 is OER, and it supports my learning goals for that class, um, and it supports the Gen Ed Objective 6 goals as well. 
So I was really, really hoping to find something similar for History uh, 2201, Women in U.S. History. Um, and as you can probably anticipate from the way that I'm talking about it, it didn't quite work out that way. Uh, my experience in trying to find open um, educational resources for women in U.S. history uh, was much more of a struggle. Um, history 1111, the U.S. History Survey and you know, the course that comes after it, uh, 1112, which does more 20th century U.S. history. These are courses that every university in the country teaches. Um, and they're courses that in many states, uh, students are required to take, in fact. So it makes sense that there were OER resources for that kind of class. Women in U.S. History is also a really popular course nationwide, but it's not a course, as far as I know, that any state mandates students take. Um, and some universities, particularly smaller colleges and universities, might not offer a Women in U.S. History course. So I think that contributes to the fact that there wasn't an OER resource for Women in U.S. History um, because it isn't as broadly taught as the U.S. History Survey is. Um, so that's that's part of what shaped my experience of doing this work. History 2201, Women in U.S. History, is also a general education course. It's not a GEM course. Um, it's an ISU Gen Ed um, Objective 9 that speaks to cultural diversity. And I'll just read you one of the objectives from um, Objective 9 identify the defining characteristics of culturally diverse communities in regional, national, or global context. Um, this is much more of a content-driven course, and those objectives in Gen Ed 9 are much more content-driven as well. Um, so it's not to say that I discard skill building entirely. Any opportunity I have to teach undergraduates about what it is that historians do, how fun research can be, um, how it's much more than just memorizing dates and names is an opportunity I'll take. However, the emphasis in that, again, because of where it fits in the gen ed curriculum is more content driven. Um, so the textbook that I was looking for for women in US history for 2201 needed to cover the content areas um, that I wanted the course to cover. It wasn't necessarily about pulling things together to emphasize skill building or giving students the opportunity to find resources, though I do a little bit of that. Um, it was more about thinking through a textbook narrative that could very neatly encapsulate some of the things that I do in lecture, some of the things that I have students do in discussion, some of the kinds of assignments I give in that course as well. Um, History 2201, 2201, excuse me, is also a course that I teach online asynchronously, which presents it own, its own set of concerns. Um, I've taught History 1111 in a lot of different formats, including in person. Um, 2201, I've not taught at ISU in person before. I will in the fall, so I might re-examine some of these materials again, um, which also means, you know, I think when we're teaching online asynchronously, one of the things that we need to be aware of in designing our courses is that it's not um, as easy for students to ask for clarification as it is when you're talking with students in the classroom. So for instance, in online asynchronous courses, I develop pretty robust, rub robust rubrics. I mean, I use rubrics in all my courses, but these are highly specific. Um, my slides include more text than they do for an in-person class. Um, and the text that I assign are going to be more comprehensive than what I might give in an in-person class. So that has also shaped what I was looking for in 2201, the format that I've offered the class in. Um, so I wanted a textbook for 2201 that would cover both primary and secondary text. I wanted it to have basically everything. I realized I was sort of looking for a unicorn here, um, but I was familiar with some of the resources available for teaching U.S. women's history and knew that there were things like that out there. Um, one of the first things that I did was compiled a list of textbooks in the field. Um, and it's is it possible for me to share my screen? I can actually show you what I what I did. Okay. There is that. Okay, awesome. So hopefully you are seeing this. 
Um, and great. And I can see you all now too. Um, so this was, you know, my very simple uh, resource that I created uh, for myself to assess what was out there. Um, I uh, examined a bunch of different textbooks that were generally suited to teaching a class like this one, a women's history survey. One thing I also had to keep in mind is that at ISU, this is a one semester course. At a lot of universities, women's US women's history is, is a two semester course. So you'll notice some of the textbooks um, do not cover the entire span of US women's history because many universities teach it as a two course sequence instead of one. Um, what I did is I assessed whether the course covered, or whether the textbook, excuse me, covered the time period I wanted to cover in the class, whether they included primary or secondary sources or both. Um, and then I had a bunch of different price calculations, which I can talk about how I was thinking about those in a moment. And then information about, you know, the, the actual content that was covered, because again, this is a content driven course. Um, I found that of these nine textbooks that I assessed, three of them did the things that I wanted them to do. They had the expansive coverage of the time period I wanted to cover, and they included both primary and secondary sources. The other ones I looked at, I kind of crossed off my list for a variety of reasons. So for instance, this one, U.S. Women's History Untangling the Threads of Sisterhood, it's a very fine book, um, but it's a secondary source reader with 10 essays written by historians, and it only covers modern U.S. history, 18th 65 to the present. So it wasn't really suited for what I wanted in this class. These three um, at the top, numbers two, three, and four here, um, were basically my main contenders. And there is a price difference in these textbooks. Um, I, in any of my classes, am, am cognizant of the price of textbooks. And I realized that in history, a lot of our books are not as expensive as they might be in say biology or chemistry, um, but I do try to keep costs down. Um, one of the things I was really concerned with was the rental price of the textbook because I've noticed Many of my students rent their textbooks now. They, they're not necessarily purchasing them, but it's very common for them to rent. I also wanted to pay attention to the availability of an ebook. I've noticed a lot of students really do prefer ebooks. However, I do have a lot of students that want the physical text. They want the print copy as well. So I was looking for something that could be affordable in either format, either an ebook or a um, print textbook. And so I went with this one, Women's America Refocusing the Past by Linda Kerber, um, as well as some other editors. It covered the time period I wanted to cover. It covered the content I wanted to cover. Um, it was the lowest price of these three options um, and had more used copies available too, um, so that students could you know, go on whatever their favorite used book website is and find cheaper copies than buying it new. Uh, and it also had a relatively stable rental price. Um, one of the things that I noticed as I was preparing for this presentation is that the data that I compiled this summer about the prices had changed. I needed to update everything. Um, most of these textbooks were about $15 cheaper when I looked in at July. Um, so the price of publishing, the price of books has gone up. You know, we've we've talked about the price of um, everything going up, generally speaking. That has affected textbooks. Um, luckily, the ebook price for the book that I use remained the same. That did not go up. Um, I was just, I was very surprised by how quickly and how much um, the cost went up. So I think that might be a good reminder that if you have found affordable books in the past, um, or you've been using the same books for a particular course, you might want to go and just see what it's retailing for now, um, because I would suspect that the price may have changed. And I found that with virtually everything um, on my list here. Um, okay. 
So as you can see from my spreadsheet there that I showed, um, there wasn't a free resource available. Um, I did find that the New York Historical Society has a online women's history textbook, but it's, it's meant for high schoolers. It's also incomplete. Um, it doesn't have anything in the past like 50 to 60 years, which I think is actually really vitally important uh, to teach in any history course, uh, contemporary relevance. Um, so that did not really fit my needs. Um, so again, the thing that kind of influenced this was content driven, but also price driven and as well as format. Um, so overall, um, I have a few more thoughts on this process of looking for OER texts, as well as the process of doing so for History 1111, which I did a few years ago. Um, you know, I think that it would be really great if there were an OER textbook for US women's history. Um, however, in history, in our discipline, writing a textbook is usually a five to six year project. Uh, it's also usually a project that is quite expensive, that requires a lot of licensing, uh, a lot of permissions, not only of things like images, um, but also to either reprint or to um, synthesize or print in an edited form other scholarship that people have written on the field, uh, in the field. And usually as well, when we're talking about history textbooks, we're talking about multiple co-editors who work across many different time periods. I basically live in the 1830s and 40s. That's what I study and that's what I know really well. And even though I teach a wide span of time, um, if I were tasked with selecting the most important historical texts about the 1830s and 40s, I'd be fine. To do that for the 1950s, I would struggle. I could tell you the things that teach really well, but as far as the past three decades of scholarship in that field, we're talking thousands of books. Um, so subject special specialists are important in writing textbooks, and that's often why you see, especially for history books, like seven or eight different editors listed um, for, for a book. Um, the other thing that I'll say, and I know that this has come up in other conversations about OER at ISU, uh, as well as other places, not, not just ISU, um, in history, textbooks are not original research, and they're generally not peer-reviewed in the same way original research publications are. So they are not part of our tenure and portfolio, tenure and promotion portfolio package. Um, because in history, we really do emphasize um, the the original resource research publication, particularly books, uh, as being the marker of whether or not you get tenure. So there's not that kind of like institutional, like within historians, institutional uh, incentive to write a textbook, particularly given how time intensive it is. Um, and then the other thing that has come up in terms of OER is this issue of um, publishers in the field of history. So publishers in the field of history generally do want OER. They want people to read the books that historians are writing. However, um, usually book contracts will indicate that if you want your publication to be available freely online, you need a subvention from the university uh, that you work at to pay for this. Um, typically about eight to $10,000, depending on which press you're publishing with. Um, and at ISU, we do not have those resources. Um, and I don't believe in Idaho in general, we have those resources. So that might be something to think about going forward if we're thinking of ways to fund OER, particularly at the state level. Um, if this is something we want to invest in, I think we need to think about what our researchers and scholars at the universities are doing and what are the ways that we can make their publications available freely um, in an online format. That does require money, but I think, you know, as we've seen with, with the adoption of OER textbooks in the classroom, it pays off for our students. Okay, um, and I'll, I'm happy to talk about any of this and answer any questions, but I'll end my presentation there. Thank you so much, Dr. Mauricio. I am so glad I remembered to hit the record button <laughs> because you brought up so many good points 
that I'm hoping others will refer to later uh, because other people in the state do watch these recordings. And uh, there is a state push towards OER, and you brought up so many points that I hadn't thought of before uh, that I can see probably don't just apply to history, but do apply to other fields. Uh, Liz, maybe you can speak to this like anthropology. Uh, I could see it applying to other fields as well. And um, I'm, a, I'm a fixer by nature. And so I'm, I'm already thinking of, of things like, oh, maybe there should be a statewide cohort of historians for, for women's history and each do this part. And maybe there should be a statewide grant. And, you know, so <laughs> um, that, not that, it, that that's just off the top of my, my, my head, but I think this, I think you've brought up so many points that speak to a bigger conversation. Mm -hmm. And I think that's hopefully what you're, you're hoping. Yes, absolutely. I think that, um, you know, taking the example of the American history textbook I use, um, this was one that has been a collaborative effort dozens of historians have worked on. And I think it works really well because of that, because there are a lot of, um, I'm going to mess up the metaphor, but like lot, lots of hands make easy work, some, uh -huh. something along those lines. Um, lots of people contributing, I think, re results in a better product, right? Results uh -huh. in a better end result that's more thorough and, and vetted. Uh, and it also means that, um, you know, people are more likely to sign on <laughs> to work on this textbook if they they know, right. okay, I'm responsible for this section of the chapter rather than I'm responsible for the, this hundred year time span. I think that's that's really crucial. Yeah, and, and it could even be a whole, uh, because there's an OER North West group. Oh, oh, and I'm gonna mess it up. I can't remember the name of it. Uh, not just Idaho OER, but yeah, exactly. Many hands make light work. There it is. My mother used to say that to me all the time. <laughs> um, so Spencer has asked a question. Thank you, Spencer. Uh, how have students responded to your OER efforts? And maybe this would speak more towards your previous uh, US history OER project uh, that you were able to implement. Mm -hmm. sure. um, but maybe this also talks about this textbook um, that you chose because it did fit with it does fit within the parameters of O A O A E R, which is open and affordable. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, one of the things that I really love about using an OER resource in History Eleven Eleven is students have their materials on day one, um, particularly because it's an online resource. Um, we can pull it up together in class so we can find exactly what we're talking about. Um, and nobody falls behind, right? Because it's, it's all available from day one. I think students really like that textbook. They find it um, quite accessible. They find it quite readable. It's a high quality book um, that I think competes with any of the print textbooks out there for US history. So generally the response has been really positive. And I have had students say to me that um, they really appreciate that they did not have to purchase anything for that class, that it was a relief to not have to think about um, how they are going to get the funding? How are they going to get the money to purchase this, this book? Um, in terms of the affordable textbook, the Women's America textbook that I use in history, U.S. history, U.S. women's history, I always mess up the title. Um, that one, um, I think because it's available as a digital book, as an ebook. Um, that can be rented fairly inexpensively. I've noticed most students access it that way. Um, mm -hmm. By and large, the majority of my students rent their textbooks like, and, and eBooks are extremely popular. Though of course at ISU, we have a lot of adult learners. I have a lot of adult learners in my classes who 
and, and this is like not an official study that I've uh, vetted in any way, many of my adult learners prefer a paper textbook, um, actually, as do I, that's, that's my preference um, to have paper. Um, that might be a generational shift, maybe, maybe not. Um, but I think that regardless of what kind of text I'm using, I want it to be available in multiple formats because we have students who prefer all of these various formats. So I think we need that flexibility. Thank you. That was an excellent answer. And and I and I think Reed Hepler, thank you for uh, sticking in the chat the link to OER West Network. That's what I was thinking of. Appreciate that very much. Okay. Um, while anybody else is putting a question in the chat, or you're free to un to unmute yourself, you can talk. This is um, yes. Thank you very much for the presentation. I just wanted to. Um, I did actually jot down um, some questions. <laughs> oh. I had one one question that I thought was and 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 then I think we can can wrap it up. Ah, Liz, I'll let, I'll 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 ask yours first and then we'll wrap up with mine. Can you clarify what is considered affordable? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes, this is a great question. <laughs> what is considered affordable? Um, I cannot remember, and I feel horrible, I cannot remember the name of the person that I met with in the ITRC who helped me um, with this project, but when I initially showed her the matrix of my textbooks, I was really worried because like, none of these are, are free, which is really what I was hoping for. Um, and her response was, oh, okay, but that's, you know, that would count as affordable. So I'm not sure what the threshold is. I know that we have those, um, and I'm sure you know this, Liz, and I've seen this, but we have the ability now when we list our courses on Bengal Web to indicate the cost of materials, which is which is awesome. Um, and I believe this fits into the second tier of that category. So it's not the cheapest, but it's it's somewhere in the middle. Yes, I think it was Kim. That sounds right. Um, who I met with and and helped me with this project. There's been some discussion um, in certain groups on campus um, that this move toward um, publicizing for students um, the uh, cost associated with the course in terms of textbooks um, will lead to students selecting courses with no cost or low cost over others. Um, and in some uh, disciplines, it's really challenging to get away from those really high priced mm. textbooks. Um, because, you know, in, say for chemistry, um, mm -hmm. the, the textbooks can cost $150 and you need something that presents it that clearly. Mm -hmm. um, for me personally, I have um, at starting next semester, no textbooks for any courses ever. That's it. I'm done. Mm -hmm. um, but, um, but that's because there are some really good OER resources and the um, especially in linguistics for a while there weren't. There were for phonetics, there is, okay, I say that I'm not requiring a textbook. There is a textbook that you can get for $7, or you can use a free website um, that is basically the textbook is uploaded now. Um, but uh, yeah, so I know that some people are concerned about that. I'm, le I'm not concerned as much given my discipline, but mm -hmm. also because I was one of those students who had to scramble to buy three $150 textbooks at any given time. Um, as a single mom of four, that was not always um, feasible. Um, but uh, but yeah, I'm wondering how you um, how you would respond to those concerns as people raise them. This is a really good question, Liz, and it's one that I hadn't considered at all. So I'm I'm really glad that you, you that you brought it up and that you know, um, you know, as a humanist, our books are, you know, my, my books in my field are generally quite inexpensive. So I really appreciate that you brought this other perspective of what our colleagues across campus might be thinking about in response to some of these initiatives. And that's a really great point. I think in history, 
our textbooks do tend to be less expensive across the board. I don't think, even among my colleagues who might not be using OEAR resources, I think there probably wouldn't be too significant of a disparity in, in cost. Um, you know, we might have that first tier and that second tier or that third tier. I don't think most of my colleagues are assigning things that are you know, a hundred dollars or, or so. There are a handful of textbooks in history. Um, there's a major problem series that I actually had on, on my matrix somewhere. Um, major problems in X history, major problems in American women's uh, history of revolutions. They're awesome textbooks. They're wonderful, but they are so dang expensive. So I never ever assign them. And I think a lot of my colleagues feel really similarly, even before we had OEAR initiatives. Um, I think we were really aware of the price again, because history textbooks do tend to be less expensive than in, in some of the sciences. But that that is a really great question. Um, I know some of our colleagues in the social sciences have worked collaboratively to try to create um, textbooks. I think if I'm remembering correctly, sociology has, has done something like this. Um, and I'm, I wonder you know, what possibilities exist for colleagues in Idaho or in the Pacific Northwest um, teaching chemistry or teaching biology. Maybe that is the route to go. But yeah, I remember the same thing, Liz, of, of not being able to buy books. And sometimes, and we hear this from our students too, they, they, if they can't afford the books, they won't buy them and they'll try to pass the class anyway. Um, and so it just, it starts our students off um, in an uneven playing field from, from the beginning. It does, and I'm thinking of my current Discover Anthropology course where um, the textbook is is a good textbook and it, it's an inherited textbook for me. So, you know, I inherited the course and so I kept the textbook, but I'll be changing next semester. Um, but it's $85 for this textbook in anthropology. Mm -hmm. And so I know, I, I talk to students about how they can rent it, about how they can rent it online in a digital version. And um, But I know that there are still a couple of students who can't afford the textbook. And so for that reason, I I put students into teams where I know that at least some of the students have textbooks and they can share those resources with each other. Um, and I talk to them about not violating copyright law um, and how, how you can share parts of a book without doing that. But it still means that those students are at a disadvantage if I'm using a textbook and relying on it heavily. Okay. So I'm trying to think about how I can get um, equally as uh, quality content um, without having a um, a nice packaged textbook for the students. Mm -hmm. so I'm, I'm really interested in this conversation. I really like that idea of teams. And, and you're right, it's not, it doesn't fix completely the issue, but it sort of moves us in a direction. Um, teams is a great idea. Um, mm -hmm. I have a colleague who does like book clubs as well. There's not one assigned book, but options that students can pick from. Um, and he has them sort of work together as they're reading through these texts. That might be another way that, you know, I'm done with the book and I can pass it to you uh, to read right. next time. I'd like to add to this conversation. Um, I'll put a plug into the library. If you have an extra copy, we can always put one on reserve. We do have a lot of teachers, instructors who will put an extra copy. At, at, on reserve at the library, students can, they can't leave the building with it, but they can check it out in building use only for two hours at a time, but it makes it so it is accessible if they're in Pocatello, does not necessarily help online. <laughs> and and that's, that was, that was going to be the comment I was going to make is that I have used reserves before, um, and I love it, um, but uh, in this day and age, a lot of students are online, um, even if they are taking a synchronous class, not an asynchronous class. Um, but then then, it, you know, it would be really it would be really wonderful if a library could have some sort of digital reserve where you could have access to the book for two hours um, in a day. And then maybe another next week, you can check it out for another two hours and and the digital access would expire. So I think we have don't we have a, a type of digital reserve? Jenny, am I wrong on that? Are you still with me? 
Yeah, you're right. But I think it's mostly for articles or sections of a book, not a whole book. Mm -hmm. um, I like if there's a digital chapter. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. We can buy ebooks. You'd have to talk to the bibliographer for your subject area. But our overall guiding principle is not to buy textbooks. Excellent. Otherwise, we don't end up a, being able to afford the um, the books that you need for your research. Mm -hmm. Right. Let's see. Uh, ebooks can be bought for more than one user at a time. Yeah, a lot of our ebooks are one to three users, and the nice thing is is that if they don't check them out, they can be a lot of depending on the publishing information, and you have to look at each one. Um, so many pages can be downloaded per day per user. So that's another option to check out as well, just the library. But, book. but when a library buys an ebook, it mm -hmm. at least triples the cost compared to the paper. Yeah. So that that slides into the uh, OAER, the affordable, because library resources aren't free, even though they feel free for students, that, that falls under the affordable category. So I, I think this finally wraps this up, but I wanted to say this this ties into the question that I was going to ask is, um, how does this influence your teaching pedagogy? Um, how did it how did you adapt your teaching style um, for your OAER um, and implementing OER and thinking about the process? So if you have any final comments. Yeah, I'll say. I mean, I, I sort of want to say yes, <laughs> yes, this has really um, helped me reexamine what I'm doing in my classes. Um, and I would say that's even true for the classes I haven't adapted, you know, with with 1111 or 1112. It's it's made me really focus in on what is it that I want my course to do? Like, what do I really need my class to do? What tools do my students need to accomplish that goal? And pull out anything anything that kind of doesn't serve that need, especially in terms of purchases. Um, so it has made me more aware of, um, you know, what exactly I'm asking students to do before they even step foot in the classroom or log into Moodle for the class, like what are the kind of barriers for entry. Um, so it's had an impact on every class I teach, not not just these. And, you know, this was true, especially for 1111. It gave me an opportunity to rewrite my syllabus to really emphasize skill building, emphasize methodology, um, make use of the resources that are available for free online or through the subscription databases at the library. Many of many of those databases, by the way, students are not aware of <laughs> that they have access to all of these awesome resources. Um, that, you know, we, we, I think faculty sort of take for granted because we use them all the time. Um, yeah, so it's made me be very, it's, it's yet another moment to kind of build in reflection into what is it that I want my students to get out of this class? What is, what is the purpose here? Um, and really tightly focusing on that. Excellent. Thank you so much for sharing. Um, and for the comments, I thought they were very thoughtful and we had a great discussion. Um, let me see if I missed anything. Um, wonderful. So this will be available. Um, and I look forward because I'm sure uh, that you will continue, Dr. Stengel, uh, in your OER efforts. And, and Liz, I look forward to, um, to what you're going to bring to the table. All right. Thank you so much for your time today. Thank you, and thank you all for attending. Okay.